Hello, uh, Medical Alley and guests. Um, we have a quite a broad range of uh, attendees, both from the uh, Medical Alley area, as well as uh, across uh, the US and it looks like beyond. Um, this is a Medical Alley Association webinar and it's hosted by HTEC Group. Uh, my name is Sava Marinkovic. Uh, I'm the head of our health tech practice here. And uh, I've toiled with AI in all its glory and limitations in my own ventures, uh, as well as now with HTEC. And today's discussion is about some, um, you know, fundamental challenges about AI and healthcare and specifically in the clinical pathway. And uh, joining us are two very smart thought leaders, in my opinion, uh, Paul Mullen from G Healthcare and Sam Roos from uh, Crescendo, uh, Crescendo Health, uh, previously founded, uh, co-founded Datavant. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for joining. Um, for context, uh, we're going to assume that the audience and all the attendees are somewhat familiar already with AI, either from a technical level, a strategy design level, or a business level. Uh, if not, uh, we'll be sending out some informative links on the subject after the web webinar. So uh, just to get started contextually, uh, we know there are many forms of AI, and just to be clear, uh, there's adaptations of it. There's AI in drug discovery, AI in clinical decision support, uh, AI in imaging and diagnosis, AI in operational efficiencies and covering costs and automated workflows. So um, for context, uh, when we talk about AI, we generally uh, uh, are, are looking at the machine learning aspect of it when we look at holistically of the statistics and the expert design and then what does, what does the machine learn uh, from that. And that last one is really what we're gonna draw attention today. So first uh, I'd like to ask Paul for um, uh, just a short intro and, and what's your kind of interest and background uh, in, in, uh, in AI? Oh, th thanks for uh, organizing it, Sava. It's great to be here. Um, I'm an engineer by training. I've spent uh, almost my entire career in one company at GE Healthcare. Uh, but uh, unlike many people in a big corporate environment, I've been sort of a startup leader within that big company for almost my entire time. And so I've had the chance to be sort of at the edge of what probably won't work, but let's go figure out how to make it work kinds of projects uh, throughout that. Uh, most people would think of me as an ultrasound guy. And so I do have a little bit of an imaging background, uh, but recently uh, my interest has been in how do we use uh, some of the contemporary mathematics that we lump into this area we call AI uh, to improve situational awareness for caregivers. And uh, there's a big story we can tell around that, but I lead a team of people that are trying to figure out how do we make sure that caregivers uh, are able to subscribe to information they really want rather than being the victims of data that pe other people think they ought to have. So that's my interest at the moment. Great, great, thanks, Paul. Um, Sam, uh, would you like to uh, briefly introduce yourself and also uh, just say what your interest and in kind of background in AI is? Uh, likewise, great to be here, and thank you, Sala, for organizing this, and Medical Alley and HTEC for bringing this, this group together. Uh, so quick quick background on me. Uh, I'm a molecular biologist by training, uh, but quickly realized that my passion lay at finding ways to translate scientific insights into tools that would help people. Uh, so spent the first chapter of my career uh, working in different pockets of the healthcare industry, from biopharma to device to diagnostics. And, uh, frequently bumping my head against the wall with the paucity of data that was available to inform uh, the decisions that I and my teams needed to make in terms of clinical development and commercialization of these assets. Uh, so I uh, took, a, took a detour into entrepreneurship to tackle some of those problems. I uh, co-founded a company called Datavent, uh, which supports folks in taking different de-identified data sets from multiple places and linking them together in a way that preserves privacy, but allows for folks to track a patient across different settings. I, in that capacity, had the privilege of working with many leaders in healthcare analytics, 
uh, including many that were deploying ML and AI tools um, using some of these data foundations that we were supporting and pulling together. Uh, after after a, uh, some time working with DataVet, I got excited about uh, some challenges in the world of clinical trials. And so I founded my current company, Crescendo Health, uh, which essentially oriented around uh, expanding the picture for clinical researchers of a patient's journey across multiple care settings beyond the clinical trial site. Uh, so where right now uh, medical research is focused on a relatively small sliver, sliver of what occurs at the uh, clinical trial site, we're providing the, the tools and methods to expand that view of those consenting patients uh, to include the uh, entirety of their healthcare journey and enable new methods of clinical trials to be deployed by sponsors. Uh, so tremendously excited to, to be here today to discuss some issues that are both quite important in the world of uh, the intersection of data and, and AI, and also as a uh, future customer of many AI tools for data curation, uh, excited to have this conversation. Uh, awesome, thanks, Sam. Um, Paul, I will uh, I will open up uh, with you and just start with a question that that is um, in debate right now: is is AI overhyped, or where is it overhyped? Well, yeah, of course it's overhyped. I mean, that's the nature of new technologies, right? And, um, you know, my one of my favorite points of view is the pessimists are often right, but the optimists get a lot more done. And, and you know, I think hype is a reflection of the optimism of people who are trying to solve really big problems. Um, but let me just put this in context. I, yes, it's hyped. That doesn't mean it's bad. <laughs> And, and so, you know, when I started my career graduating with a degree in engineering back in the early 1980s, there was, uh, you know, the microprocessor, the generalizable microprocessor was a really big thing. And I was super excited about doing high-speed digital design. You know, and I was working on digital x-ray systems. Somebody else was working on digital ECG or, you know, a microprocessor controlled x-ray system, a microprocessor controlled ECG, a microprocessor controlled CT scanner. You know, for goodness sakes, the toaster in my home kitchen said microprocessor controlled toaster. And, you know, the, the infatuation with the microprocessor was, I think, a reflection of the idea that the microprocessor is going to, it was a technical innovation that's going to matter. Did it matter in the moment? It's debatable. But at some point, what happened was that technology became so commonly adopted that no longer does anybody actually know which microprocessor is running Zoom on my PC. And I really don't know which one is inside of my Android device. It's sort of the now the water in which we swim. And I think we're just early in that phase around, pick your favorite expression of this contemporary area of mathematics that we call AI or machine learning, or you know, pick, your, pick a sub area. Yes, it's hyped. Nah, hyping it is not such a bad idea. It does confuse business leaders and it confuses consumers that it gets hyped. That nevertheless, I think is just a reflection of the natural tech cycle that we're in. But is it from, I mean, how do you sort through? Like there's some really successful adoptions of AI um, in sure. kind of augmenting support. So where is where how do you filter that out? How do you filter out the hype? Wow. If you could answer the question, how do you filter out the hype, you'd solve all kinds of social issues, right? I mean, we wouldn't have debates about how to deal with COVID and we wouldn't have debates about how to solve uh, questions of inequity. <laughs> I think uh, the way you sort through those things, I think, is you actually have to work on specific problems. One of the areas, and, and I'm not totally an expert in this place, uh, but I think what I'm hearing from my friends who are, is in the medical space in particular, questions of in image interpretation are probably way ahead of the other applications of AI in healthcare. And you could ask yourself why that might be. Um, I don't know if this is causal, but I think it's related. And that, that is that image-based analysis is largely a mathematically solved problem. And you know that because you can search for a cat in it, in, online and you'll get pictures of cats facing you and turned away from you and on their hands and doing stupid tricks. So visual interpretation of images is in many ways to solve science. 
Um, and now it's a matter of application. Uh, and that's why you might see a number of algorithms in, you know, in CT or X-ray. We have a really good example of a workflow in that where you uh, now are going to have to give a patient feeding through a nasogastric tube. So to put up through somebody's nose, through the science, the, their sinuses, and then down into their stomach. And one of the dangers of feeding somebody before you know that that tube is in the right place is you could actually have the tube in in the lungs, you could have the tube twisted up in the esophagus, the tube could be in all kinds of really bad places. And so what you really want to do is you want to wait until you know the tube's in the right place. And how do you know the tube's in the right place? You, you do a chest x-ray. And then you have to wait for the radiologist to read it and have the radiologist say, yep, the tube's in the stomach, you can go ahead and feed the patient. Meanwhile, hours have gone by and you've got a patient who didn't get fed. You know, there are very easy image interpretation algorithms that can say the tube is straight and it's right where it ought to be, and you don't have to wait for a human interpretation of that. And so that kind of thing is, is quite easy. If you get into the area where you're starting to say, can I use uh, AI and ML to do forecasting of patient condition, that is nowhere close to being a solved science. And at best, what I think we're seeing is that AI-based forecasting algorithms are being approximately as good as humans, sometimes better, but not enough better to justify their adoption. And I think, you know, in our, our pre-conference discussion, Salah, I think you've got a slide that's going to illustrate that. So as we think about the applications in medicine, there are some places where the hype is justified the applications are real and the use case, the way in which we either change the course of care for our patients or we change the course of the uh, economics of the caregiving, I think those are very real and I think imaging is a great place to look at. Once you get to forecasting though, I, I'm, um, I'm an optimistic skeptic. So I'm gonna jump, I'm, I'm gonna jump on that um, first point before going to this chart about model development, but, um, I mean, uh, it sounds like uh, what I've heard a lot is do imaging, do diagnosis, throw in AI and ML, train the system, and it's going to be great, better than the current approach. The technical definition, I think this is in some of the FDA guidance, is that AI is actually part statistics, part expert design, and part machine learning. I think that's the group, the three major kind of legs of the stool of, of AI. And so if you have a diagnostic device that is, I just like expertly designed um, and it doesn't have ML, why do you need ML? I mean, that is that is that the hype part? Because you already have the, the expert design. What is it? Why does ML uh, make a difference? Well, it's a webinar all by itself, right? I, I don't okay. know, Sam, Sam, you may have a point of view on this, but here's what I would offer. Uh, the FDA definition is a good one. It misses a key additional uh, element, and that is usability. And the usability, I think, is a key part of the way FDA looks at lots of things. In fact, they not only look at usability, they look at uh, um, even unintended misuse. And is your design robust against unintended misuse? And, um, you know, we have to think our way through those things as we look forward. But here's an example. I had a team <clears throat> working for me that was looking at forecasting uh, patient stability for, in order to facilitate the discharge of patients who are likely to be hemodynamically stable. So essentially, can I safely either discharge them or at least decelerate their care to a lower level of acuity? And we had an algorithm about which I was quite proud and, you know, went to the board of directors and, you know, we were high-fiving about how great the team was and nobody adopted. And, you know, what's the problem? Well, the problem was this algorithm was incrementally better than what humans would do on their own. The algorithm was well-tested, generalizable, but, you know, it wasn't a whole lot. It was no easier to use than the clinical intuition that comes out of the simple early warning scores that people already use every day. And so why would I go to a computer to do the math that I've done in my head and that my human pattern recognition system is already telling me is wise? 
And the answer there was the machine-based answer was good, but not good enough or not dramatically better to replace what's an existing well-working system of human intuition. But in the That doesn't mean that all problems will be like that, but that was my yeah. experience. But in the corporate um, kind of budgeting and maybe even in early stage ventures, um, you know, that could sell. Oh, we do a machine learning thing. This is the microprocessor yeah, yeah, yeah. today, right? Yeah, the sales guys love it because it's something to talk about. Uh, by Sam, the way, I, uh, I, I don't want to bash all of this. I, I think it's really good. I, like I said, I'm an optimistic skeptic. I think we absolutely have to work on this. It's worthy of our best efforts, but we're not there yet. Okay. Sam, uh, do you want to comment on that, especially kind of comparing between diagnostic devices and, 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 the, and, the, and, this, uh, and an AI ML approach? Yeah, we'd love to. Uh, so I think the, to your first question, what are, what are the areas where ML has unique value that it can bring beyond uh, uh, models that are uh, well designed by an expert and are working in a very predictable way? Uh, and, and to me, there's really two main virtues. Uh, the first is working with highly, uh, highly complex data where you've got many different variables coming in uh, and those variables might look different in different settings. Uh, and so as you, you think about how to create meaningful insights from that as it's uh, moving across a range of different contexts, uh, that's one area where good ML um, really can deliver value beyond something that is uh, designed from the ground up with, uh, with human eyes. Uh, and the second is its adaptability. Uh, and I think that also speaks to your, your question here of what are some of the main differences from the world of diagnostics? Uh, one of the virtues of ML is that uh, it holds the promise of changing with changes in clinical care. Uh, as care practice changes, there is opportunity for a feedback loop uh, that looks at those, those changes and adapts the model to incorporate them and to make good recommendations, even as the background is shifting. Uh, and so there's a, a lot that we can learn from the world of uh, diagnostic development from traditional diagnostics in the world of clinical genomics or laboratory tests that we can translate uh, over to the world of uh, AI-enabled devices. Uh, uh, thinking about terms of area under the curve, sensitivity, specificity, uh, clinical validation, what are the ways in which we take these tools through a process that from the ground up confirms that uh, they are have the correct analytical validation, uh, what they purport to be seen uh, uh, in terms of the data is actually there, the clinical validation, uh, that uh, it actually maps to the clinical phenotype of the patient uh, and workflow validation that uh, this is actually going to be something actionable by the clinicians that are using it that will drive better outcomes. Um, I think that the, the piece that uh, where AI enabled devices have an additional burden is that uh, because uh, oftentimes there are meaningful changes in the way that care is delivered, they might see uh, shifts in their inputs uh, as the products spend years on the market. Uh, and the question becomes, how do, you, how do you deal with those real world changes in workflows, those real world changes in care practice that might change the inputs that are available to you or the validity and predictive uh, power of your model? Uh, and so uh, I think as we uh, go deeper into this conversation, uh, it will become uh, clear that it's in incumbent on folks that are developing particularly tools that are, are making use of real world health data as part of their uh, machine learning uh, predictive power to also have a set of predefined uh, uh, checkpoints uh, once they reach the market. FDA calls this the predetermined change control plan. Uh, where they are uh, revisiting how their model is performing and uh, making uh, corrections as needed to reflect changes in care practice. Um, <clears throat> super interesting. I, I mean, I, I think that in terms of the, the differences in this between a, a device and the AIML is something I think uh, we talked about before, which is how do, how do, um, how do you address the challenge of machine learning tools that are that are basically a black box concept uh, against a clinician's desire to understand how something's working? That to me is the biggest difference of this, and that's and and that comes maybe to Paul to your point about usability, because if you can't communicate the functionality of it, is this something that clinicians 
in the future now have to start going blindly and say, we got to trust this. Yeah, I, I think this is going to be a multi-step thing. Um, you know, to, back to the old analogy, you know, I remember my, my grandmother, you know, she got a calculator and she'd do the math in the calculator and she'd check it by hand. Uh, I mean, <laughs> at some point, you know, she didn't need to do that anymore, although I'm not quite sure what that time was. Um, I, I think AI and workflow is going to be a lot easier for people to absorb. Um, AI in terms of what's the diagnosis you should have reached or what's the likely prognosis of the patient is going to be an area where uh, healthy skepticism will serve us well. Um, but I think, you know, the air, we often talk about AI as a black box and uh, for sure, AI can be a black box if not properly explored, but that doesn't mean you have unexplained uh, resulting algorithms. And, you know, we've done a lot of work on explainable AI. It's not a, I would not accept the premise that once you have a tuned algorithm that you can't then go sort out what are the factors which are driving the prognosis or diagnosis that you've reached. And uh, so I think that's just a matter of people uh, figuring out how to express it in a way that's easily absorbed. I, 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 yeah, I, it, I think it's easy to toss, uh, to toss rocks at the concept, but I don't think it's that hard to solve. One thing I, I'd add to that is um, I, I think that transparency and how the models are developed, the data on which they've trained is tremendously important here. Uh, you know, one, one cautionary tale, uh, there was a, a, a great study that came out of uh, Ziad Obermeyer's group at, at UC Berkeley uh, that was essentially looking at a, uh, a model deployed by um, a uh, large, uh, lar large uh, uh, payer group that was uh, intended to identify patients who were in need of higher acuity care, uh, and this model was uh, using uh, past cost of care for patients as proxy for health burden. Basically, the more dollars that we spend on these patients, the sicker they were, uh, and these are patients who should be flagged for uh, more, uh, uh, more, a greater degree of attention, uh, more nursing support um, when they come back into the health system next and, and folks fit this profile. Um, but what this group found is they, they looked at how this model performed in practice is that uh, in reality, it was perpetuating uh, many biases that had been uh, long in place in the healthcare system, that uh, folks, uh, that, that Black Americans were receiving lower quality care because they had fewer healthcare dollars spent on them in the past. Uh, and so this, this algorithm that was intended to do good, that didn't have any inherent racial bias in its design, still perpetuated uh, racial biases and, and inequalities in society by uh, training the model on the, the wrong metric and using the wrong proxy. And if those methods aren't transparent uh, to the folks who are ultimately deploying these models, where they can understand how well is this going to fit our population? What are the potential areas where there might be, might be error? Or where are the ways in which the context in which this is trained is different from the context in which we're seeing patients? If that's not made available to the clinicians, to the hospital administrators, as they choose which models are right for them, uh, then they, they run the risk of deploying a model that might do more harm than good in their population. You know, you know, Sam, I, I, I was just going to say, I 100% agree with you. And the problem is that those of us who develop AI algorithms, we're really stuck with what I call a lack of self-awareness. And it, we're not intentionally blind. But for instance, if you were to use Medicare claims data as the, as, as the ground truth for an algorithm around forecasting, and you start to realize that Medicare claims data has a built-in bias around it, yeah. you'll end up exactly with the situation you just described. The problem is that for many AI developers, we're just actually not even aware of what the built-in biases are in the data. And we have to be careful, I think, that you know, we talk about things like overfitting problems, but there's, I think there is this hidden under overfitting problem 
that is going to just take years of us uh, starting to realize where our thought patterns around what the data mean start to become more mature. So yeah, I, I'm totally with you. I, I just don't want anyone to walk away from this saying, gosh, AI developers are inherently biased. It's that AI developers don't really understand the biases that are already in the existing data. And we need to improve, improve our fluency there. I think there's two parts to that, Paul. I, the first part is, is that um, uh, you have the technology, uh, like the, the organization of the team having to really put more weight on how do you, uh, what's the nature of the data and the collection? And do you have the right kind of team profile to be able to do that? And um, I've seen that quite a bit. Uh, um, and uh, this, but the flip, the, 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 um, the pair to that is that you have a lot of technologists in AI who are very good at creating models. And then when they come over to the healthcare side, miscategorizing a cat versus a dog is not as serious as an early warning for a onset of a disease. And that mindset is a fundamental difference. And these AI technologists are at the front of the development world, right? They are the, right now, they're, they're, they're the um, frontier of what's happening in many cases in, in computational areas. You can talk, let's quantum and everything else, but, uh, but for now, there's, and you know, is there hubris in this? Because they say, this is how the model is going to work. We know it's going to work. Train it, add more data. We can't over collect more data. Um, and, you know, add in, um, you know, add enough data and we, we can solve anything. But is that, the, is that true? I don't think it's true. I, I don't think that it's, it's simply a matter of kind of pour, pour more data uh, on the problem and uh, the problem will be solved. Um, I, I think that it's a question of is, is it the right data? Is it fit for the purpose for which you want to deploy it? Uh, so there's, uh, th this is an area we could go quite deep in, but yeah. uh, I think there are, there are issues of uh, hidden uh, risks in the data that you're training your models on. Uh, do you have an understanding of the provenance of that data, how it's collected, uh, the time and the care workflows in which it's collected? Um, do you have an understanding of if that data has been linked together in some way? What are the matching methods that have been used to link that data? And what does that then do to the statistical performance of your model downstream? Uh, and then you've also got the issue uh, of uh, which I, I think a number of folks have started to bump up against of if you train your model uh, on, uh, on a single center um, or even on a regional clusters of, of health systems uh, and the model performs well, as you shift that into a new, uh, new setting, you know, say a model that's trained in Ohio is going to work very differently uh, in California where you've got <laughs> uh, different uh, socioeconomic factors and the patients who are being treated, which we know the social determinants of health have a tremendous impact on uh, the right care for the right patient. Um, but beyond that, there's also meaningful differences in the ways that these different hospitals deliver care. It's yeah. not one size fits all. Uh, so we, we need to be cognizant of that as we think through how to, how to deploy, the, develop these solutions for an audience. And, and you're right, and it's not just a matter of will, because even if you take Bayesian reasoning and you realize that the new likelihood is based on your pre-existing incidence of data. And you go from London, Ontario to London, UK, you will get a different pre-existing prevalence. And so and let me just play this out. I, I, I think for some people, this might be helpful. So I'm one of those people with a recreational DNA surprise. So I signed up for, um, ancestries, you know, tell me about what does my DNA say? It, just because I'm like a machine learning AI guy, I wanted to see what they, what, what they would do. And my family name is Mullen. My mother's family name is Williams. You're probably thinking British Isles somewhere. And mine came back over 50% Eastern European. And, you know, we're all scratching our heads. And so I posted something on Facebook that says, hey, either the test is a scam or you know, there's some un, 
disclosed hanky panky in my family to which my mom replies on Facebook, love you, call me. And today I have about 50 brothers and sisters that I didn't know existed four or five years ago. And what happened is it turns out that my dad, you know, couldn't have children. So my parents did this thing that was experiment in the late 1950s, early 60s. And we started to look at artificial insemination and boom, there they are. So that's exciting. But what's interesting is that group of brothers and sisters is predominantly in healthcare. More than half of us are either physicians, nurses, health tech, uh, or in that space. And everybody said, wow, this is amazing. Look at the DNA connections that really drive people into healthcare. And they have ignored the possibility that their sampling bias that comes from people who are in healthcare or who are more likely to do the test than people who are not in healthcare. And, you know, it's a fun story. And it's interesting to see how AI drove that. And it's interesting also to see how you would reach conclusions based on that data, but actually forget the idea that there's an inherent pre-existing incidence rate, which might show up as sampling bias, or it might show up as just an actual incidence rate. And teasing that out is as much a part of the science as the actual gradient descent algorithm that you use to create your next algo. Well, again, that, that to me sounds, um, it, when we look at these kind of regional biases of data between you know, geographies and, and building in these models, again, that is a strategy issue in AI. And a lot of people just go head first and probably because they don't understand how the whole thing works because they, they, they uh, you have to, I think, especially the teams that are put together uh, need this depth in understanding patients, clinical, and other because it's too easy to get uh, your, your uh, some kind of confirmation bias, like you said, uh, among some of the other hidden risks. I, I mean, um, Sam, do you want to mention another hidden risk? You mentioned that there was like you know when we're looking at the right data and and the right form, like what's another hidden risk on this? I think that confirmation bias is probably the biggest one. Well, it, you know, to to, uh, uh, to to quote the wise uh, Donald Rumsfeld, there are you know known unknowns and there are unknown unknowns. Uh, in the world of uh, machine learning, uh, especially at the intersection of healthcare, there are a wide possibility of unknown unknowns. Uh, and so, I, I think that it's it's folly in um, many of these tools where there is um, an intersection of. AI and clinical decision support to assume that you uh, will be able to anticipate all of the different patient populations that tool might interact with the different care settings. Uh, and so, of course, you want to do your diligence, um, but it's important as well to have transparency in uh, the uh, characteristics of the data that you train your model on, uh, the way in which your model works. Uh, so that ultimately the user who has a much better understanding of the way that they deliver care, what their patient population looks like, can assess uh, for their own use, whether that is going to be fit for their purpose. Uh, so I, I think one of the most important things to, uh, to, to be, be cautious about is to avoid the hubris of assuming that you can uh, control all of the variables. Uh, the delivery of healthcare is, is, is messy and it's uh, uh, very difficult to predict across many different settings. Um, and I think that we've seen across many different, uh, many different examples uh, out in the real world that uh, as these tools have been, been launched and made available to the wide public that they've behaved in different ways in certain care settings that their designers uh, might not have anticipated. Okay. So in terms of speaking of hubris, there was an article that came out in Wired earlier this summer about Epic's early sepsis warning system. And I, it caused basically an uproar. And, and in short, for people who haven't um, read this, uh, we'll have links sent out after the webinar for, for some of the topic points that we've discussed. But in, in essence, the the... Um, there was a researcher who went to look at the actual data of, of EPIC's system. So they introduced an early sepsis detection system that was AI uh, based. And in the implementation, the researchers found that there were 67% uh, of the alerts were a false positive. And, um, 
and the, imp the decrease in mortality was about 4%, I believe. And so digging a little bit deeper, you see that actually part of the training set that they used was using reimbursement codes for one, to your point, Paul. But uh, I mean, that to me would infuriate me as a clinician, which is saying like, why are you wasting my time with the faulty system that comes out? And, um, and was this a design issue or not? Was this, you know, there, what is the safeguard on that? There's new guidelines in the beginning of January that, are, that have come out by the FDA, which, which uh, the eight page summary is quite a good read. Uh, but what is, you know, that's, in, that's a kind of, that should infuriate any clinician because now you have to deal with alert fatigue and um, you have to ask yourself, was this epic, how did Epic approach this? Or why did, how did we get to that point? And how do you avoid that point in the future? These are, because that is, it sounds to me like there was a co-development issue with clinicians to understand how the system works. And, um, and that it, it was kind of faulty in there. I'll, I'll actually, um, Paul, what do you think? You did work with sepsis before. What's your thoughts on it, especially in that context? First of all, I, I will say that, you know, whether you're talking about um, the very, very public concern around the EPIC algorithm, or you're talking about many of the less public ones, I think we have to see them not as failures, but as disappointments. Uh, I'm, you know, I've been a product developer my entire career. And this is hard. This is really, really hard to do. And unless we make these disappointing advances little by little, we aren't going to get to, this, to the celebratory answers in the end. There's going to be the occasional serendipity that gets us to something terrific, but most of it's just going to be hard work and grit. And so I celebrate the fact that they tried. I'm not particularly sure I celebrate the deployment that put the, uh, I call it the well-being of the caregivers who are now subject to all of these alerts. I'm not sure I celebrate that, but I would at least celebrate the effort. Um, and you, there are many others. You, you mentioned this one, but there's lots of others out there. So what do we do with that? And I worry <clears throat> that if we wait for the perfect algorithm, uh, we're not going to make any progress. We just have to put the right boundary conditions on it to make sure that we're learning as we go. Um, I, I'm a participant in a human um, human factors engineering conference in, in March. And one of the big questions we're asking at that conference is, what do we do with the stream blindness that we all deal with as we get data all throughout the day? If these algorithms can start to reduce the stream blindness, then I think they're helpful. And then we just have to sort our way through. How do we become aware of the biases in the data? How do we become aware of what are the um, algorithmic you know, optimization issues around it? The, those things are you know, sort of, you wouldn't have to be an expert panelist to say the things I've just said there. Yeah. The thing that's really hard is this question about where do you want to set the bias point in your algorithm around false positives? Because nobody will be generous to you with a false negative. You know, yes. my grandma died because your system didn't click an alert when it was supposed to. And yet on a population health perspective, we probably do a lot of damage by distracting caregivers with false positives. What I've just said to you is not new to anybody who's been trying to work in this space. Um, and so I come at it with disappointment and sympathy at the same time. So let me, sh let me put this slide up here. Let me see, can you see this now? Um, so yeah. this is a two by two matrix. And basically on, on the left side is the degree that uh, practitioners adopt or adopt successfully. and, and Across the top is where I'll call it tech is good and tech is faulty. So there's this discussion about it, what is the tech um, 
what does it mean to be faulty? Is it something like Epic system or, or like the sepsis system or not? So, so if the tech is good, meaning that it, it's positive on clinical results and the practitioners meaningfully adopt that, that's probably the ideal solution and it's, and it's meaningful in there. But if the, if the tech is faulty and the practitioners either adopt or are forced to, to adopt, then you have this risk to patients. This is this upper right corner here. And it could be misleading, again, for the false negative and false positive kind of dynamic that occurs. Sometimes the tech could be good, but the, the, the practitioners poorly adopt. This is very uh, common in melanoma detection. You could have very um, substantive screening algorithms, but uh, general practitioners may not adopt it because there's not enough time in there uh, or the, the reimbursement incentive is not there or a dermatologist might rather do another more profitable procedure, let's say. Uh, a lot of dynamics of them not adopting. So, so that is a missed opportunity. Um, but, uh, and then you have this fourth one where actually the, the tech is kind of faulty and the practitioners poorly adapt. Well, in that case, it's, that means patients don't get better care, but there is actually a, a poor data collection if they try to improve the technology because they might have a data, uh, a data quality issues of the data that they do collect, is it meaningful or not? Sam, what do you think about this? Um, you know, I'd almost put another axis on here, which is that uh, the, 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 the tech is, uh, is good in, in specific contexts. Um, and, uh, you know, is it, is, it, is it good in the, is it an issue of the practitioners that are failing to effectively adopt it? Or is it that the tech did not, uh, was never going to be effective in that novel context? And, you know, referencing back to the, the EPIC conversation, uh, you know, I, I can't profess to be an expert on, in the world of uh, sepsis prediction models, but, you know, in looking at the, the data that's come out, you know, there was the Michigan study, which uh, cast out on the model but then there's also been recent data coming out of this at of Ohio hospitals, which have spoken to their real world experience that has suggested positive outcomes from the deploying model. Uh, and I think it's a, a thread worth pulling on there. Of, uh, is, is there something different about what the patients and what the workflows look like between these two different real world independent studies uh, that uh, might suggest the best context in which to deploy something like the sepsis prediction model? Um, and I, I think that, you know, what we're highlighting here is that, um, you, you know, in looking at the data, and Stanford put out a great study looking at different uh, deployments of AI in clinical care and found that a, a hefty preponderance of them were trained on retrospective data uh, yeah. as both the training and the validation model. Um, and I think that we need to, to learn from this to see that it's important to prospectively uh, validate, not just in one context, but in multiple contexts, a, a new model that's deployed to confirm that it's actually going to work the way that it's intended in a range of different contexts. You know, that, that it kind of reminds me of um, people who are looking at, at, at trying to predict uh, stock market movements and they use historical data and they try to capture these prediction models. But uh, if the model is not correct, you can get things like what happened with long-term capital management and these crashes or these kind of black swan events that just kind of crush all the returns in, in a market. And I think that same mindset is the issue with the retrospective models, except is there something catastrophic that won't show up like using an AI model in a different subgroup that it wasn't originally trained on? And can you anticipate that? Like, so looking between regions, for example, example or otherwise. Paul, any, um, well, I, I want to, use this chance to go to something about the validation side, which is, um, which is about the, uh, um, the, the actual shininess and hype cycle. And I think that there, there's been a movement to, um, to change this. And I'll, I'll show this screen here, which is, um, this is a, a recent study on looking at a systematic review of AI use in the ICU and papers over time. So 
in here, uh, you have on the left axis, basically the level of readiness of a AI-based technology, going from model prototyping to validating to real-time testing, workflow integration, and clinical outcomes. And over time, the number of papers in here and the frequencies of those papers. So what you see here is that they're all pretty much staying on the same level here. There's a lot of papers about prototypes, a lot of works around prototypes and the models, but much less, you'd expect these numbers of models to go down um, and get more into clinical outcome evaluations. And you see this big gap here that, that you're, these kinds of new models aren't getting into clinical outcomes. And, I, and to me, this is endemic of, of, um, of trying to tie in this loop. What's the reason behind that? I think it's a good question. I, Paul, what, what do you, why do you think the reason is this? Uh, that's a highly technical answer. It's hard. <laughs> and, and, you know, I think, um, you know, just thinking back, you know, if, you know, we look at the old Star Wars movies and we say, wow, that animation was pretty awful. And yet at the time it was a breakthrough and we were all pretty excited about it. And I, I think we can study these things and we can say, isn't this awful? And it is in the sense of the number of dollars uh, in, invested here, the number of disappointed investors who've looked into this space. But you really touched on a metaphysical problem a little bit ago, Savo, when you said, hey, you know, we're doing all of this on retrospective data. The problem is that we actually don't have data from the future yet. <laughs> and, you know, it's awfully hard to hold uh, somebody accountable for data that do, do not yet exist. Um, so it's a real metaphysical problem, but it is nevertheless the set of cards we've been dealt. So we've got to continue to advance the cause here. What I would say about this is I think that some of the problems to which we've tried to apply AI have been too ambitious and we are just now learning where is the proper application of those problems. And I, I, I don't actually know because this particular chart came out of a, a pediatric ICU journal, which is a very interesting uh, journal. I don't know how many of those big balls along line three and four, how many of them were in sepsis, but I bet that about, uh, you know, between a third and a half of them were probably in sepsis because it's such a hot topic. And yet that is such a multifactorial disease uh, or condition, it, very, very hard to sort out. And uh, by the way, out of the University of Pittsburgh, there's been some great publications about looking how there's different cohorts within this, the way in which sepsis actually uh, develops. I think it's a great paper. I'll try to find the link for you that you could um, follow along. But it's, these are, we've gone at like big, big swings here. I think uh, at least the way I'm leading my team is to go for more modest swings. And I think we'll start to find a bit more progress. And as we improve both in our understanding of the interesting math around this and the, the caveats around data, I think this is gonna improve over time. Uh, but I think the symptom here is just simply that everybody wants to have the silver bullet here. Um, and so we've gone for really big swings. Uh, it, it, just one more analogy. If you were to look at drug discovery in the pharmaceutical business, you know, at some point, the whole idea around drug discovery was, well, let's just try a whole bunch of molecules and then see which ones seem to have an impact on the disease. It was sort of a scattershot approach to it. And we'd have these big matrices with different, uh, uh, different markers on it. It's a little bit of what's happened here. Yeah. Um, so I'm going uh, to uh, just say a short kind of retort to that to say that I think there's much more effort needed in proper AI strategy design and architecture yeah, than yeah. necessarily trying to get more data. I think, I think the data is important, but I get a sense that there's also a large amount of groupthink in designing AI because you have all these set tools and you have all these courses and you have a lot of stuff that comes in out of there, but it's really a, um, it's, I think there's a, there's a movement of group thinking here 
that caught on the technology side that if you don't have out of the box thinkers who really understand the context of what's going on, they're gonna keep going down that road. And I know that firsthand experience on, on my um, AI venture where it's, you know, you sometimes you have to change paradigms in AI and the, and the way you input the data in order to get different kind of results. We have about uh, eight minutes left. There are a few questions in here I wanna get to, and then we could kind of wrap up with a few con conclusions. There's a lot to talk here. And I think um, there's a lot ahead that we can kind of dig in in, in more specific areas. But um, here's a question. Is the patient's ability to use uh, or adopt tech a concern as well, or is that considered the responsibility of the practitioners? Well, I, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, go a, ahead. Point, a point of view. I think that our patients, broadly speaking, are more competent in tech than we give them credit for. And we've seen a lot of that through the pandemic. But all of this conversation so far has been about AI developers producing forecasting tools and classification tools specifically for professional healthcare. So I would say that's the responsibility of the practitioners in the context of this question. I, yeah, yeah, it makes me think of, of um, are you really doing usability testing to your original point about the fourth axis on, on the FDA de definition of this um, in a sense that you understand what the impact is of the patient on the way that the tool is eventually used? It's hard to say. We're, we're, we have a AI solution that is taking something that's completely manual. And the first step in that is, is making it 80% automated and 20% manual with an ultimate goal of having it be 100% automated. But we're taking kind of like what you said, a modest swing to do it. And I think you, you can't, sometimes it's trying to boil the ocean because you have a lot of data and it's hard to do. Sam, I think you have experience in that on, on the data side. Yeah. So. Um, a, a couple of things I would uh, just, just slot in. Uh, one is that as we tune these models, um, ultimately there's a decision of where do you pick on the curve the trade-off between sensitivity and specificity, you know, false positive versus false negative tolerance. Um, and it's important to engage with patients to understand, you know, especially for those false positives, what is the potential psychosocial harm uh, that could arise uh, from those if those are directly communicated to the patients. Of course, there's clinical harm that can arise from care that's delivered from those, those false positives. But um, as we, we think about what is right to deploy and what is the right uh, place on that curve to, uh, to tune the tools to, uh, taking an input from clinicians and patients to understand how it impacts all stakeholders is important. Um, you know, it's also important if we're, we're using uh, real world data as an input to these tools to recognize that the availability of that real world data is going to look different patient to patient, um, depending on uh, the proportion of the care that they receive that is in that institution's data catchment. Um, and if you are going to, you know, Stanford Hospital for the first time for specialty care, they're not going to necessarily have your full medical history at their disposal to uh, inform your care in the same way that they would for a patient that they provide primary care and uh, you know, a huge amount of um, that and have had a long relationship with. Um, so that, those are a couple of considerations um, as we, we think about the specific patient experience. You know, uh, that, that's, a, that's a really uh, great point kind of contextually. And, and I just, you know, that is, there's an a, that AI in uh, clinical decision support and maybe an AI in kind of diagnosis. I think in areas where you have cost efficiencies, AI ac actually looking at kind of um, operational and cost efficiencies, it definitely could show things that are, uh, that may not make, like that may be not obvious to reduce on. So that has a lower bar of impact on the patient than others. Um, there's a question about where else does AI identify relationships that don't make sense intuitively. It's kind of like AlphaGo um, creating, playing uh, a game of Go that these Go masters had no like idea of, of, of playing a certain approach. And now that's changed the game of Go. Mm -hmm. So in healthcare, are there things that are to be uncovered that can change the way that, um, 
that go through on these. Well, yeah, uh, of course. <laughs> I, I think Patrick's question <clears throat> is also, he's asking the other question, which is, is, could AI lead us to bad outcomes because it's showing us a relationship that doesn't exist? And, you know, I, I think <clears throat> that would be answered by being an AI practitioner and you'd start to get to the question of overfitting. And, you know, that just, there's, you know, that's a whole course you can take just on that topic alone. Um, and what is also related to the question of overfitting is the computational load, because you might decide <clears throat> that you really like to have an algorithm that takes into account certain potential like modifiers to an outcome becomes so computationally heavy to do so that it doesn't make any sense to deploy it. So he, he's asked a really interesting question here. For sure, we're going to find relationships that we didn't suspect, and we're going to have a whole lot of problems with overfitting. And then you know, I think this is where you need to bring, you know, we're not yet at the point of independent AI where it's just going to solve the problem. So these are still human curated processes and it will be for a while, I think. Um, yeah, I, uh, I think. Yeah, and Nathan just said, not just overfitting, spurious correlations. Yes. Of course, uh, at some point you can't give a comprehensive answer on a, on a panel discussion. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Okay, we got time for another. Um, let's do one more question here. How can young physicians uh, prepare and enable themselves so that if or when AI becomes more mainstream, we can maximize its use and stay most relevant? You know, I, I think one one piece to call out is that in, in some places it already is. Um, you know, there are well over a hundred AI enabled FDA approved devices that are out there in the wild today. Uh, and so it already is a component of, of clinical practice. Um, you know, and I think viewing it like any other healthcare product of asking the questions of what is the evidence uh, that undergirds the, this, this product, but especially asking the questions of uh, based on how this was validated, um, how, how well does that validation map to my own institution? is one of the best things that uh, clinicians can do to, uh, to serve their patients and uh, considering deploying one of these new models if they do indeed have the choice. Oh, great. We're just uh, at, uh, out of time at the moment. So I'll just say um, th there's, there's a few more questions inside uh, that we'll uh, answer uh, after the webinar to send out, but um, to respect everyone's time, I want to just close with a few things, which is, um, I think that one of the conclusions uh, is looking at kind of how do you organize the teams? You have to have the right team profile to organize in, into this AI, extremely important when you're pro uh, tackling these problems. Uh, the second part is having the right um, data strategies and the right design strategies in terms of how do you manage both, both of those ends and I'd, I'd say that in, in the third case is that there's lower hanging fruit in certain types of implementations of AI in healthcare than others. So operational efficiencies is an easier one. Um, and uh, then uh, doing a diagnosis uh, in, in a sense. And maybe a, a fifth conclusion on this is that, um, you know, the, those technologists who are in AI have to look at um, if they're not in healthcare, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, there's a fundamental different weight um, and you have, to, you cannot, you have to understand the context and the regulatory sphere behind it. So those are my conclusions. Paul, would you like to say something? And then Sam. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that if you were listening to this webinar and you came at it, you know, without, a whole lot of preconceived notions, you'd walk out of it pretty depressed because what we've just highlighted is a whole list of problems. Yeah. And I th the thing that I think we have to take on as an industry is that big problems are really inspiring. And this deserves our best efforts with people who are curious. We should load up our teams both with... Uh, with zealots and with, with skeptics. 
so that at every turn we have an opportunity to go at it. But if you were to walk out of this panel discussion and say, ah, crap, there's just a whole bunch of problems here. Then I think you've just joined the chorus of folks <clears throat> who will give up. And I just think that's really unwise. And so I think there's real wisdom in this combination of situ awareness of our situation as AI developers combined with the innocence of the optimist. And I, I, we got to have both of those. Agree with you. AI is a powerful weapon and not also just because there's a lot of hype to push it into certain implementations. Yeah. Um, but you, you got, I think the part of it is this, you have to have this humble, knowledgeable approach to it and not be cavalier. I think that's the point is you cannot have cavalier interpretations just because you can get results. Sam, do you want to add your, your uh, final thoughts on this? Uh, I, I think you both have captured it well. What I would add to Paul's comments is, you know, for, for me personally, one of the reasons that I, I love working in the healthcare industry is precisely because it, it is so broken. Um, it's a spot that is so tremendously important for society, for patients. Uh, and there's so many, so many interesting problems to be solved that when they are solved, uh, have deep and meaningful impacts in real people's lives. Uh, and how, how rewarding is it to be able to work in, in such a sector where they're just, it's rife with opportunities to see that connection between the work that you're doing in your day to day and real positive impacts in, in people's lives. Um, and of course, as we do so, we need to remember that there are real folks at the end of these tools that we're developing. And, you know, I, I think one of the themes that I want to reinforce here is the importance of doing uh, uh, ensuring that you've got a strategy around prospective real world validation for these tools um, and uh, for those that are ultimately using them, uh, considering the ways in which it, uh, the tools have been validated for their specific context and uh, what additional evidence they might want to see. Um, but, uh, you know, zooming out, I think we're, we're at a very exciting time where we're seeing new tools and methods come into healthcare. And as we, we look looked at 10, 20 years forward, uh, this ultimately is going to, to benefit us, benefit us all. Uh, so excited to see the uh, products that have yet to be built um, that deploy these tools to the benefit of patients. Great, Sam. There's like 10 major points we touched on in this webinar and, and each of them is worthy of its own discussion in itself. So I appreciate, um, appreciate the, uh, the uh, contributions and the discussion. Uh, a special thanks to Medical Alley uh, for um, helping us put this all together. And, uh, and on behalf of HTEC, I want to thank all of you. We're going to send out um, some links uh, after this session in the, in the next day or so, uh, so that you could look at some of the references we spoke about and um, look forward to having future discussions. Thanks very much, Paul. Thanks, Sam.